Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association today uh, for Spotlight Endometriosis Session. Today, we're going to discuss the topic of adenomyosis. Today, I'm sitting on the opposite end of the presentation. I am your host, Dr. Janelle Jackman, and I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter, Dr. Eugenio Colon, today, who will be discussing extensively on adenomyosis. So a little background on Dr. Jose Eugenio Colon. I'm going to call him Dr. Eugenio right now. That's what his preference will be, right? So Dr. Eugenio is a high volume board certified specialist. He works at the Center for Endometriosis Care. He specializes in laparoscopic excision of endometriosis and advanced minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. Previously with the CEC Surgical Fellow, he returned to the center and rejoined Dr. Sanova in early 2023 um, from his role as a director of the St. Louis University Center for Endometriosis and assistant professor in the Department of OBGYN and Women's Health in the Division of Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery. It, at St. Louis University School of Medicine, Dr. Eugenio is a compassionate, committed endometriosis and adenomyosis advocate with an interest in improving the landscape of care through his vast efforts. He's also especially dedicated to improving medical access in the Latin American community, and to that end, continues to serve patients in the Dominican Republic, as well as where he is part of the EFF sorry, the EFS gynecology and obstetrics team in Santo Domingo. Dr. Eugenio also continues to teach globally and has trained many other physicians in the meticulous excision of endometriosis, including from the diagram, the uterus, and other vital organs. Thank you so much, Dr. Eugenio. And before I start his press, before I allow him to start his presentation, I just wanted to read the disclaimer for the TTEA today. So I want everyone to be assured that Dr. Eugenio has a wealth of knowledge, but this information that he's sharing with you today on this event is for general, professional, and informational purposes. It's educational only. It does not constitute as professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment for individuals. And please consult your own healthcare professional if you have questions about your health or before starting any treatment. The views and opinions expressed in this event are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect or represent the views and opinions held by the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association, the TTA, EA, sponsors or donors. Due to the nature of this event, it may contain content copyrighted by other another entity or persons. The TTA sponsors and donors claims no copyright to said content. The TTA is a messenger and share of information and strives to verify but cannot warrant the accuracy of copyrights or completeness of the information on this program. If you have a complaint or find your content is being used incorrectly, please contact the TTEA prior to making copyright claims. Any infringement was not done on purpose and will be rectified to all parties' satisfaction. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Eugenio, and I'm going to hand over the mic to you. It's such a pleasure um, to host you today. My actually the push is all mine. I mean, I, I actually cherish these opportunities to go in and, and do some education on on, on endometriosis, adenomyosis, and everything related to chronic pelvic pain in our female population. Um, so because of in the interest of time, actually, I'm just gonna kind of gloss over all these topics. So we have a lot more time to talk to participants and ask and answer questions. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're basically we're just gonna talk about what what is adenomyosis per se. So uh, as you said, I am actually currently at the Center of Endometriosis Care, which is, for me, feels like coming back to home, right? This information is only for educational purposes only, um, and anything that we discuss here is actually more to educate and, and, and promote the, the, the awareness of endometriosis and adenomyosis. Um, so really quickly into the point, what is adenomyosis? So the exact origin of adenomyosis, we don't necessarily know what it is, unfortunately. Um, so the, because the pathology of itself, it's very, very poorly understood. So although the true origins remain as unknown, certain risk factors associated to the development of the pathology itself are unknown. So several studies have found an association between multiple number of pregnancies and the presence of adenomyosis. Um, and sometimes even if um, there's a greater association in those patients that have had a history of abortion. 
right? No, although although this, adenomyosis can also appear in patients that are in young girls, uh, they, they can appear, uh, but the, the risk is increased as patients are older. Other known risk factors for adenomyosis are um, any patients that have had any type of uterine manipulation, a DNC or any uterine surgery, or patients that have a used tamoxifen in the, in the past. So during adenomyosis, there are two things that are super important, which is, a, uh, which is basically um, the development and progression that's linked to abnormal tissue growth with increased invasion capability, right? So what happens in these things is that you have an inflama inflammation association characteristics of these cells and also angiogenesis, so which means the promotion of new new blood vessels, new abnormal blood vessels, right? Now, um, when we continue talking about adenomyosis, it's super important to understand the anatomy, right? Because everything goes down to the anatomy. So this is a sonogram, and we're basically, um, we're looking at the uterus from top to bottom. So this right here, where you see the my, my, um, my cursor, you're seeing basically the tip of the sonogram, and then we're looking at the uterus just like this. So the uterus is basically made out of two different cell types. So we Latinos call the uterus the matrix, but that's a that's a that's that's more for another time. Now the inner lining of the uterus is called the endo inside metrium matrix, and the muscle of the uterus is called myo, Latin for muscle, metrium or muscle of the matrix. Now the muscle of the uterus itself has multiple layers, right? So in this slide, you see the innermost layer, which is basically the stratum functionalis, which is covered by the stratum basalis, right, which is that yellow layer that you see. Now, the, the, the pregnancy attaches itself to the stratum functionalis, but what's basically the outer layer or the muscle of the uterus is both the junctional zone and the outer myometrium. But pay attention to what the junctional zone, because we're going to talk about that uh, about this more in a moment. Now, there are two there are two different types of adenomyosis that we described, right? The two major types. So it's a diffuse adenomyosis, which basically means that um, the adenomyosis itself has spread throughout the whole muscle portion of the uterus. Now think about this. When you have a, a vaccine shot in your arm, you get pain um, even a couple of days after you forgot that you had the shot, right? You may be in your computer doing something and then somebody, some, uh, and at a couple of moments, somebody asks you to like hold something and you raise your arm and you feel pain. Uh, you again feel high pain at the site of the, the injection of your vaccine. So that happens because you have water in a muscle group, right? You have water outside of the muscle. So what happens when you contract that muscle, the pressure within the muscle shoots up and that causes a significant amount of pain. So this is the exact same principle of pain in adenomyosis. Now you have a muscle that is basically injected with multiple types of abnormal, like with, with abnormal tissue in multiple areas of the muscle itself. In this form, the diffuse form, again, remember when we talked about angiogenesis or formation of new blood vessels or, uh, or, or exacerbation of all these blood vessels around these lesions because of the amount of inflammation that occurs. When you're having a period and the uterus is contracting, remember that the uterus is symmetrical. So the front layer of the uterus is flat, the back layer of the uterus of the inner lining is flat. So when the uterus is, when you're bleeding, the way that the uterus stops you from bleeding to death is basically by closing. But when your muscle itself is invaded by multiple diffuse areas of adenomyosis, when the uterus has to close, imagine that you have 50 vaccine shots in an arm, and then you suddenly have to raise and lower and raise your or lower your arm. So that's kind of the same principle, like the, in, a in a very, very basic way to explain it. Now, another way that you can have adenomyosis in some patients is basically having what's called, um, correction. It's basically having what's called an adenomyoma. So an adenomyoma is one focal area of adenomyosis, and this is usually more common in the back wall of the uterus. So this big focal area, it's usually, um, it's easier to, under, to, to evaluate during surgery. It's easier to remove during surgery because it's just one focal area that you can go cut around it and remove, the, 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 um, remove that abnormality. It usually, as I said before, affects the posterior face of the uterus more than the anterior face, and it's easier to address at the time of surgery. So in this quick case that we're going to talk about, this is a 34-year-old G1P1 patient that had more, more than six years of infertility after she had a successful cesarean section before. Um, this patient was noted to have, um, because of the infertility, um, 
we evaluated the patient because endometriosis is one of those things that's associated to adenomyosis and it's associated to infertility as well. So in this particular patient, she had one failed uh, intrauterine, uh, intrauterine insemination plus one failed uh, trial of IVF. Particularly, I had the pleasure of operating her sister because she had a lot of pain as well. So we didn't know that she already had a family member that had extensive endometriosis surgery and she did have extensive pathology at the time of surgery. So she was able to get pregnant at a younger age. And now, six to seven years later, she's trying to get pregnant again, but is unsuccessful. So when we went inside and, and um, went inside and did her surgery, one of the things that I find is in, on, on top of the muscle of the uterus and the front face of the uterus, I find a plaque of either, which I thought was more adenomyosis versus endometriosis, but it's definitely a plaque of tissue that is invading part of the muscle of the uterus. So what can we do? So I start using the CO2 laser and identifying this plaque that's right at the surface of the uterus, but it's invading a little bit into the surface myometrium. So I'm using the CO2 laser in, in sweeping motions. And look at that. That's the first pocket that we find a fluid within the muscle. So that's exactly what happens when you get a vaccine. Within a muscle, you get injection of a, of a, of a liquid. And this is what happens when patients are having their periods or or changes in the hormonal composition, what happens is that it, within the muscle, they bleed into, they develop these this type, this uh, um, little tiny pockets of fluid, and this causes extensive pain when things are moving. So there are multiple theories um, or that we think actually uh, cause adenomyosis, right? So we do know that there are some things that can increase the risk, and one of them is actually having endometriosis per se. So there's a lot of recent talks about shared genes and aberrant gene expressions between adenomyosis, fibroids, endometriosis, right? So there are deep in, in uh, what happens is there's a deep invasion of endometriosis of endo or endometrial cells into the myometrium, into the muscle of the uterus. And which can cause, as I said before, it can cause angiogenesis formation of new blood vessels on top of the fact that they can also, some of these uh, 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 cells or cell pockets can actually have or express what's called progesterone resistance. Now, there are new talks about the bacterial microbiome and alterations in patients with, uh, and alteration in patients with adenomyosis. And I'm actually pretty excited about these new types of research that's going on. So some of the symptoms that patients with adenomyosis can experience is what? Abnormal uterine bleeding, they can increase clots because the uterus cannot contract properly. So because it doesn't contract properly while you're having your period, you can have a way more bleeding, which can lead to way more clots. So the clots actually also cause a lot of pain. In fact, I had a patient recently that she felt that whenever she was having a period and she was passing a big clot, that she felt like she was giving birth. And that's because this clot is coming through the cervical canal, right? And when it's doing that, it's basically disturbing all these nerve endings at the cervix which can cause extensive amount of pain. These patients can also sometimes have anemia because they have very prolonged bleeding. And the pain usually, in my experience at least, it's usually worse on the second day of the period, not on the first day. And now when patients do have adenomyosis, what also do they have? They have increased risk of pregnancy loss and infertility, which is very much the same case when patients have endometriosis. This is because adenomyosis can cause Chronic and, chronic and acute inflammation in the tissue. And imagine trying to grow a, a, a healthy baby within a uterus that is basically surrounded by so much inflammation, which is one of the reasons also why endometriosis, it increases the risk of first trimester loss and, oh, and some of these, in some of these patients, right? So the classical diagnosis, so there's a lot of different tools that we use to, to detect adenomyosis. <laughs> one of the things that we do is, it's basically history helps us significantly. But when we remove it, unless if sometimes if you're doing a, a, a removing a fibroid and sometimes some of the pieces of the fibroid make or that or tissue that is very soft around this fibroid can actually be classified as adenomyosis. But usually in order to have a true diagnosis of adenomyosis, you need histo histology, meaning you need to perform a hysterectomy or remove a portion of the uterus, in this case, an adenomyoma and send it to pathology so it's inspected and classified as adenomyosis. Now, 
there are very there are a lot of Im different imager modalities that we utilize to uh, to aid ourselves in detecting if a patient has adenomyosis or not. And again, nature is symmetry, right? So what we're trying to look for <clears throat> is a symmetrical correlation between the front face of the uterus and the posterior face of the uterus. So this is a patient that basically you're cutting her this way, looking from one side to the other. And in the front <clears throat> over here, you would see where her belly button would be. Then this is her pubic bone. <clears throat> this thing that you see white over here is her bladder. And on top of the bladder, what do you have? The uterus and patients that have an antiverted uterus, right? So here you see the front face of the uterus that goes from this white line to this white line, which is the endometrium. But you see the posterior face of the uterus, which is quite more aberrant and significantly rounder over here. So this is one of those things that when you can find focal cystic changes within the myometrium, especially in the area that we talked earlier, which is the junctional zone, right? So this increase in abnormal growth within the junctional zone is very characteristic of patients with adenomyosis. <clears throat> I apologize. So a lot of, sometimes we can do uh, sonograms and within the sonograms, we can also tell that the, the um, look a little bit more about the symmetry of the uterus. If it's enlarged, it could be diffusely enlarged or localized when it's, again, more and more common in the posterior portion of the uterus itself. You patients can sometimes have subendometrial cysts, and, but we're looking for irregular junctional zones and what's called a heterogeneous myometrium. So whenever you guys get a sonogram, ask for a copy and look to see if the, if the, end, if the myometrium or muscle of the matrix or uterus in this case it's actually heterogeneous, which is what we don't want to find. We want to find a homogeneous uterus and the muscle, meaning it's all one type of tissue, right? Some patients we can find, in some cases, we can find myometrial lakes and globular repeating uterus. So it appears more like a balloon instead of the regular portion of the uterus. And again, what the, the abnormality occurs at the my, inner myometrium or the junctional zone, and this is the area where that endometrium can actually invade. So how does it look when it's invading and when we do a hysteroscopy? So when we do hysteroscopies, for example, in these pictures from Dr. Luis Alonso from Spain, which is a great hysteroscopist, you can see here that he has pictures in which he's looking at the inner lining of the uterus. And in here, he's finding abnormal pool lakes, like the one that I was removing from the top face of the uterus. And in here, what do you find? You sometimes find holes within the lake, within the, the inner face of the uterus, the endometrium. So think about what happens in this case. The placenta, when patients get pregnant, the placenta has to attach to the inner lining of the uterus. So as the placenta is attaching to the inner lining of the uterus, it has to have a beautiful and very exact connection or a handshake between the placenta and the inner lining. But if the inner lining is full of some of these pockets of blood, right, that means that the placenta is not going to uh, uh, attach itself properly, or if it attaches itself over some of these holes, then that could lead to increase in miscarriages, right? So now look at this. There's, um, in this, there's a particular study that was done in which they had 104 patients, right? They did, they, they did what's called a, uh, they injected dye in order to see if the fallopian tubes were open or not, right? So what they found is that when you have this, in some of these cases, they find in 26% uh, of the patients noted that when they did these type of studies, they noted that the uterus itself became dyed. So instead of, the, instead of some of this dye not only coming out of the fallopian tube, it would actually make its way from the inner, inner cavity into the muscle of the uterus. So think about the slide that we saw earlier, where you have some of these holes that are into the muscle. So when you inject this dye into the, into the uterus, it's supposed to only come out the fallopian tubes. But if the, if the uterine walls have some of these holes in, it can actually penetrate all the way to the surface of the uterus and look something like this, right? So histological assessment of the uterine biopsies in some of the, in the 26% of these patients in this study did confirm the diagnosis of, of adenomyosis, right? Now, in this particular video that we're looking here, basically the, the, another great doctor who's in Spain, Dr. Sergio Haimovic, he's doing a hysteroscopy. And again, think about what happens when you do a hysteroscopy and you're finding some of these lakes right under the endometrium, but it's actually invading into the myometrium. So look at here, he's with a hysteroscope, he's touching it, right? And blood just squirts out abnormally. So if you have a placenta that's attaching itself to that portion of the uterus, 
and for whatever reason it bleeds, that blood behind the placenta automatically increases the risk of miscarriage. And this is another cute, another pocket. And as soon as he touches the very light pressure, blood squirts out of that area. And again, any placenta that attacks itself in these areas can increase, can have an increased risk of, of early, uh, early miscarriage. Okay. Now, what is the prevalence of adenomyosis? So the, the, the prevalence in women with 20% of women with menorrhagia and pelvic pain and infertility, right? So it's very important to understand this. Also, the diagnosis may be affected at the time if the patient is on hormonal suppression at the time of surgery because the glands may be very, very small, right? So, but the prevalence around is, is around 20%. Now, the incidence of the incidence of adenomyosis, it's very, very difficult to quantify, right? Because there's not a there's not a one true standardization non-invasive non-invasive test in order to determine if the patient has true adenomyosis or not. A lot of these, uh, the way that we know is by basically doing surgery, either removing a portion of it or doing a hysterectomy and sending it for pathology. So it's very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to identify a very, uh, a very true incidence of the disease itself. Now, we do know that diseases that, are, that like adenomyosis and endometriosis have a massive financial impact, family impact, mental health impact. Okay, so studies have sh uh, have showed in the past that patients with adenomyosis can have a significant lower rate of pregnancy, and as I said before, an increased risk of miscarriage from uh, some of the videos that I just showed you. Right. So the true prevalence of adenomyosis is unknown, and sometimes the sonogram is normal, but pathology may come back as adenomyosis. And why is this? Because it all depends on the time of the month that the sonogram was done. And then secondly, it also depends on the experience of the person that's doing the sonogram. A lot of patients that I see in the office say, well, I just had a sonogram recently. And I'm like, great, but I need to do one. Because when you have a sonogram, but a person that does not focus on this, they may not understand that you're not only looking for the size of the, the uterus, the size of the ovaries, but I'm also looking for how are things moving if things are stuck on the right side, if the right fallopian tube is stuck, if the left, if the left ovary is stuck, to what is it stuck to? What's pulling? If the if the posterior, if the back of the uterus is actually sliding over the bowel, or, or if they're stuck together. So that's why sometimes we have to repeat some of these sonograms. But again, the the true prevalence of the disease because of this is unknown. Okay. Now the treatment options for this are way varied. But again, management is not standardized. So there are no guidelines to prioritize one treatment modality over another, right? So which is why, again, we focus on individualizing the treatment on the, for the patient, depending on her age or symptoms and how, what is important to her. Does she want to get pregnant in the future? Is this not the, or she's not, doesn't want to get pregnant in the future. Does, is she okay having medical uh, advice? Sometimes we offer interventional radiology in which we go in, and we can do uterine artery embolizations so that we can basically decrease the blood supply to the uterus itself and kind of, and kind of cause a mini heart attack to the uterus, which would sh shrink the blood supply to the uterus, when, which would make the uterus itself and the muscle of the uterus to become uh, atrophic. Sometimes we have to do, uh, take the patient back to the operating room, uh, even if they want to get pregnant, because we want, need, may need to decrease the size specifically when you have an adenomyoma but you cannot necessarily do this all the time when patients have diffuse adenomyosis. But it's important that we make patient-centric decisions, which is why we conversations is the number one thing that we need to do when we see patients with adenomyosis and preparing them for what lies ahead. So in the treatments, it's super important to do self-management, right? So sorely, it's, it's limited due to the nature of the symptoms of the patient. So depending on if she's having a lot of bleeding, we can do. We can use medication that's going to basically slow down the bleeding or stop it very, very like even faster. Uh, we can have the patients go to pelvic floor physical therapy, which is my favorite thing in the world, especially for patients with chronic pelvic pain and endometriosis and adenomyosis, because when things are hurting inside of the in, at the lower pelvis, one of the only things that you can control is actually your pelvic floor muscles. So that chronic contraction of the pelvic floor may still be there even after you do a hysterectomy. So, which is the importance of having patients do PT before surgery and after surgery as well. There's also alternate ther therapies that we can use like biofeedback, acupuncture, meditation, and, and, and having a good emotional and social support are paramount to basically treating patients properly for adenomyosis. Now, medical treatments is different. 
the number one thing that I recommend patients that are wanting to delay any specific surgical treatment for adenomyosis is to localize the, the amount of hormones that it goes. So my favorite go-to is basically using the Mirena. If the patients have been pregnant before, I would consider the, 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 um, the Mirena per se. But if this patient has not been pregnant in the past, then we can consider doing a Kylina, which is the smaller, the, the smaller IUD device. Um, um, Anti-inflammatories are very important in patients with chronic with dysmenorrhea because of adenomyosis or endometriosis, but we don't want to start them when the pain is at its highest. We want to start it a couple of days before. So if their period is supposed to come on Friday, then I want them to start taking um, uh, NSAIDs two to three days before their period starts because when the pain that happens happens because of the inflammatory process. So if we're using medications to stop the inflammatory process or it's blunted, this, they can have a much more livable period, right? Sometimes you can use Danosol progestins, you can use aromatase inhibitors. And in the future, there are a lot, they're doing a lot of research on oxytocin antagonists and dopamine agonists as well. Now, there are other studies like vagus nerve stimulation um, that can also uh, uh, help in some of these, these uh, patient uh, symptomatology. So sometimes, again, like I said before, interventional radiology, uterine artery embolization, basically, minimizing the amount of blood supply the uterus gets so it becomes atrophic. Sometimes you can do procedures in which you can basically focus uh, uh, energy on the, at the level of the uterus, and it can be done by ultrasound or by radio frequency. And this basically is basically uh, 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 burning the, the, the adenomyoma or the muscle of the uterus from the inside without significant need of downtime. Another treatment is again surgery, and this could be, and it should be done by a minimally invasive surgeon or somebody that has extensive knowledge of some of these uh, uh, um, treatment plans. And you can do remove the adenomyoma and resect, and re only resecting the bad and leaving the good. As, but patients have to understand that when you do multiple cuts on the uterus, that can increase the risk of uterine rupture at the time of, of pregnancy in the future. Hysterectomy. Unlike, a, unlike a, with endometriosis, is absolutely curative in patients with adenomyosis. Um, you can do a, a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, a total laparoscopic, uh, uh, laparoscopic super cervical hysterectomy, uh, and a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. So I know that so for some doctors, it's kind of controversial to do a super cervical hysterectomy, but the adenomyosis does not, it's not usually, lo it's not located at the level of the cervix. But in some patients with adenomyosis, if it's diffused, may have some uh, persistence of the pain if the cervix is left behind, but I usually prefer to do a, a total hysterectomy. Now, um, you could do the hysterectomy with or without the, the, the uterus, definitely remove the tubes, but I usually, in my, in my personal opinion, I try to leave, we try, I was trained to try to leave the ovaries at, at, at all because female castration is not a beautiful game. Um, the future, we have a lot of things to, can, to do in the, for the future, but important, more importantly, we're going to have to continue to listen to our patients and, and make sure that the treatment plans is something that they agree with, and we are not going to make our patients feel horrible for not listening to us. What we have to do is continue to educate them. One of the things that I love the most when patients ask me questions, I tell them, what do you believe? What, what, what have you looked for? And one of the things I have in my office, this is a beautiful sign that says, I don't know, Google it. So a lot of the times, I'm one of those doctors that lost when patients basically come and tell me, I Googled and I found this. Why? Because it, I love it because it opens the lines of communication. I can ask questions. I can figure out what you know, where the, where the knowledge is, and how can we improve your knowledge so that you can make an informed decision, right? So uh, again, thank you so much for, for all the things and the opportunity to come here and educate. And uh, now we're open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Eugenio, for that wonderful presentation on adenomyosis. Uh, very impressive. I love um, the presentation. Uh, I do have a question here for you. So can you explain the key difference between adenomyosis and endometriosis? If it's the same thing, if there's any differences, because no, so you there, are there, discussing this on an endometri spotlight endometriosis. So do people want to know what's the difference between the two entities? So first of all, it's absolutely different disease. Patient, you can have endometriosis without adenomyosis. 
and you can't have adenomyosis without endometriosis. So they can appear in conjunction, but they don't have to, right? Now, that being said, endometriosis is with endometrial-like tissue. It's not the same. It appears outside of the uterus. But when the endometrium or, or endometrial type of tissue, which is hormonal, hormonally dependent from estrogen and progesterone, it's actually invading into the muscle walls. And that causes bleeding within the muscle walls that's localized only within the muscle. So it feels like you got a vaccine in your uterus. But what happens in, ad in endometriosis is that you have extensive and inflammatory reaction on the outside and you can have new blood vessels and, and new bleeding outside of the uterus. And that causes that things that are not supposed to be stuck together, stick together, right? Because what happens with the, the simplest way to think about endometriosis is like something is hijacking your normal, your normal repair process when you get a cut. You bleed, the bleeding forms a clot, but whenever you get a, clot, a cut, the body thinks that you got hurt. So inflammation has to happen in that area which is what happens exactly in patients with endometriosis. They have massive inflammation throughout the pelvis. Multiple times that we take patients to the operating room because we're so sticklers for removing anything that looks minimally abnormal, we remove multiple specimens that have endometriosis, but we remove a lot of specimens that are negative for endometriosis, but are positive for chronic inflammation. So that tells us that the tissues look, it may not look like endo, but it's chronically inflamed. So because I don't have a microscope in my eyes, whenever I don't see something that's 100% normal, I remove it with a clean margin, thinking that that lesion, that, that lesion may be endometriosis. Thank you so much. I mm -hmm. do have another question here um, on the chat. So uh, first of all, she wants to thank you so much for this presentation. She thought it was lovely. And she wants to know if there's any reason not to get a hysterectomy if you have adenomyosis and do not want to get pregnant. Um, I personally, I, we want to do what the, what's best for the patient. So if she's not interested in getting pregnant and uh, in the, she's not interested in getting pregnant, uh, one of the things that she can do, it's one of the treatment options, right? If she's a good surgical candidate, I don't see a reason why not to do that. You can tell the patient, well, if you want to, you could probably consider doing something less invasive like an IUD. But if the patient is not wanting to do an IUD because she went to Dr. Google and did not find the risk to be something that she was able to, to go through, or she doesn't want to take birth control, or she don't, doesn't want to do the different surgical options, then it's totally okay. So the importance is if you inform the patient about her options, you can't force her to pick one option over another, right? It's what do you want to do? How can I help you? How can I be a provider to you, right? How can I, I make sure that you're doing what is best in your situation for your future, right? So in this case, I have no, if a patient is informed and wants to just to go straight for hysterectomy, I have no issues with this. Okay, and you would advise us even to like a young uh, patient, let's say yeah. someone in so, really- I mean, in this case, I don't necessarily have, have, because I know that there are a lot of doctors out there that go like, well, what if she changes her mind? What if like, she may, she may meet a man in the future and then this is the man that wants, you know, she wants to give children to. I mean, I mean, yeah, it could be a possibility, but patients are also informed about the risk of regret. Right. Right. So as long as you're informing them about all the risk and the number one risk is regret in some patients, then as long as she's making an informed decision in this time in her life, then that's all that matters. Thank you for that. OK, still going down the chat chat. Um, someone wants to confirm that someone can have endometriosis and adenomyosis at the same time. Unfortunately, is one of those things that could be a double whammy. You can definitely have endometriosis and you can definitely have adenomyosis. In some patients, when we do surgery, um, which is something that we uh, do not push on any patients, the need to do hormonal therapy um, after we do excision for endometriosis, because our goal is to remove all the disease. So a lot of our patients after surgery, I say, hey, you have options. You don't need to be on birth control. You can just take uh, anti-inflammatories. And depending on what you want for the future, you may want to use birth control or not. So uh, we never use, I never, never, never in the last 
seven years, I have not given a single patient an indication for Lupron or much less or Lissa, um, or some of these uh, GnRH agonist antagonist medications that are meant to basically hide the disease, not necessarily remove it. Why? Because I don't want to mask it. If there's something there, I actually want to go back and remove it if it's possible, which is one of the things that I that some patients are like, oh, I'm ready to go for surgery. And I ask, okay, what medications were you taking? Oh, I'm being, I've been on suppression for years. Well, great. Now we have to stop the suppression. We have to stimulate the endometrium in endometriosis and then go from there because I don't want to go in for surgery and then just find that everything is sleeping. Because if it's sleeping, I'm not going to be able to discern if the area is inflamed, if it's endometriosis or not. So I may miss more disease. So, yeah. Okay. One of our participants wants to know why the hysterectomy is curative for adenomyosis and well, not because, for endometriosis. Hmm? Well, because that's a good question. So because the adenomyosis is localized only within the uterus, it's not outside of the uterus, which is why adenomyosis is cured with a hysterectomy. But endometriosis, it's outside of the uterus. So one of the reasons we also say, like, there are patients that have extensive endometriosis and they're pain, and in order to heat, to have way more, way better pain control, you may want to do a hysterectomy. But when we tell patients, to, hey, the hysterectomy is not the treatment for endometriosis, is because we see so many patients that are castrated like dogs and they take their uterus at 25, 27, they take their ovaries right? And after they do all that, they give them estrogen. And that's bananas, right? So the reason that they're removing their ovaries is because they have extensive endometriosis. They did not remove all the disease, but because they don't have any ovaries, right? They come back a couple of weeks later, hey, or a couple of months later, hey, <clears throat> hey, doctor, uh, my vagina feels like it's 90. So I'm, I need some help or the hot flashes are killing me. Oh, I feel too bad for you that I castrated you. Let me give you estrogen. And they're giving estrogen. But what happened is that all the disease that they left behind in the first place, now it starts to grow, which is why we, again, see some patients that have a magical period, right? Patients have magical periods, like don't have a uterus, don't have, a, don't have cervix, don't have ovaries, don't have fallopian tubes. And suddenly they don't have, they have a, a regular period because they're on estrogen because all that endo that was left behind grew. So we always want to make patients understand that there's a difference. But when, but th that does not mean that a hysterectomy is not part of the treatment plan for patients with endometriosis. But it has to be individualized. And I fully agree with that. I have many patients myself who come with all these things done and they left the endo behind. So it's always interesting. I'm... Um, Anissa wants to know, can, can adenomyosis cause sharp pain out of nowhere, like if you're holding your urine? So, well, it all depends. Like you can see patients can have, um, uh, can have multiple, multiple things that are associated to, to, to endometriosis and chronic pelvic pain. So when I'm evaluating a patient in the office, I tell them there are five things that can cause chronic pelvic pain. Number one, GI, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, ulcerative colitis, um, small intestine material overgrowth, um, let's say Crohn's disease, uh, and and the best one, IBS. That most of our patients are all diagnosed with IBS, right? That's the first thing. The second thing that we do is urogenital, so painful bladder syndrome, institutional cystitis are associated to patients with chronic pelvic pain. Now, on the other, the next one is basically GYN origins, so endometriosis, adenomyosis, fibroids block fallopian tubes, endometrial cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, a lot of these things. The, the fourth thing is what? It's uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. We've all heard of somebody that goes off to war, steps on a landmine, get, gets their foot blown off, and they amputate the foot above the knee, but they feel pain in that toe that was removed under the knee, right? But why? Because the nerves that are going to that toe that was from that, from that foot that was cut are still in the leg. So they can be abnormally sending pain impulses to the brain. And lastly, patients can have what, right? They can have musculoskeletal pain. And this is where it like they have, it's like running a marathon and having your partner sit on your lap the next day 
your muscles are tired and inflamed. So there are a lot of different things that can cause pelvic pain, even though there's not a true association between holding your urine and stabbing pain from adenomyosis. But there's more than one thing that, pac that patients need to get evaluated when we're talking about adenomyosis pel and chronic pelvic pain. So it's not only one thing. And, and it's something that when, which is why our consults can sometimes take so long because, oh, I have endometriosis. Okay, great. But let's talk about all the other things that are associated to chronic pelvic pain. Because if I take a patient to the operating room and only focus on the endometriosis, but have no clue about physical therapy, trigger point injections, bladder health, bowel health, mental health, all these things need to be addressed, which is why we, we work. We do not work in a silo. We have a multidisciplinary group of doctors nationally and internationally that are, we have and contacted and proven with proven results to make sure that our patients are feeling better. Thank you so much. And I'm seeing um, another question here about, oh, just the, uh, she missed your, where's your practice? So Atlanta, Georgia, right? <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia, Center for Endometriosis in Atlanta, Georgia. And I saw um, that Heather gave the website. So if you're interested, there is the website, centerforendo.com listed. So Dr. Eugenio, do you give any dietary recommendations for patients with ad adenomyosis? So unfortunately, one of the things that I, I mean, I know what I know, but one of the things that is not really good in medical school is the, it's dietary education. It is horrible. It's literally four months, nutrition, and that's it. Out of five years of, 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 of um, out of five years of med school, right, four months was dedicated to nutrition. When then after you graduate, people are asking you, what about this? And I was like, uh, what about it? All right. So, which is why well, a lot of doctors actually it exist as a specialty. So some doctors have to actually go and do nutrition education to themselves for years before they become a nutritionist, right? Right. So, th so that's the important, unfortunately, I, I, but I know what I know, and I just refer patients to, to a nutritional uh, doctor to have that evaluation and have that and, and understand a more holistic approach to, or up to their endometriosis and adenomyosis. <clears throat> and I think that's all the questions I have today. Let me just look through and see if there's any on the Facebook group. Sorry, there is a question coming in on the Facebook group. I'll ask one in the meanwhile, um, just to throw it out there. What would, you, what would you say are the potential long-term complications or risk associated with adenomyosis if it's not treated Be, uh, besides pain? So besides pain, um, there, there is an association, for example, with endometriosis and cancer, or very, like or clear or adenocarcinoma or endometrial carcinoma, right? Um, uh, and, and endometriosis per se is associated to malignancies. To my knowledge, um, it does make sense that patients that have adenomyosis may have an increased risk, but I don't necessarily know the, 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 the actual data on that right now. So I can't give you a specific number of what patients with adenomyosis um, of having first risk of malignancies. Thank you for that. Um, so the question um, is, after hysterectomy, what treatment do you recommend uh, for menopause symptoms? And it would be great, obviously, to explain the hysterectomy versus oophorectomy <laughs> part for them first. <laughs> so, so the first thing is this. Um, when we're talking about uh, doing a hysterectomy, we're talking about removing the 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 uterus per se but the uterus and the ovaries are totally separate entities right so removing the uterus does not mean that you are removing the ovaries your hormones are actually produced within the ovaries and the two main hormones produced by ovaries are estrogen which gives you curves breasts and according to my wife intelligence and secondly progesterone right progesterone causes stops the growth of the endometrium tells if you ovulate from one side, let's say that you ovulate from your right ovary, the right ovary, when it produces progesterone, it tells the left ovary, don't you dare ovulate because if you do, then we have twins, triplets, whatever. So that's, an, that's another function of progesterone. Another function of progesterone is to do what? To also 
produce a mucus plug to limit the amount of sperm that would come into the uterus, but also limit the amount of bacteria or infections that may come into the uterus if a patient is pregnant during this month, correct? So that so taking out the uterus doesn't necessarily mean that your hormones are going to be missing. Now, again, as I said earlier, I am totally against female gastration unless this is something that the patient is extensively adamant about and she's been educated with or this patient has a history of recurring endometriomas after hysterectomy, right? Now, uh, depending on where the disease is located, in some of these patients, you do have to remove their ovaries. And when this happens, then they could go into what's called a surgical menopause. So when patients have extensive endometriosis and the uterus is removed, but not the ovaries, they have no need for hormone replacement therapy. Now, when the ovaries are removed, the only hormone replacement therapy that I'm okay giving the patient is progesterone, right? Progesterone is not going to make the endometrium grow or the endometriosis that's left behind grow. And why do I say left behind? Because endometriosis can be microscopic. If you have one spot of endometriosis here and another spot of endometriosis here, but the space in between these spots looks okay, you don't want to cut the space that looks normal, right? Because our goal is remove the bad with a clean margin or a big enough margin and go dig it out like it's a weed, but leave the good. Why? If you have two lesions that are close together, you can probably do a bigger margin and remove both lesions together. But if our two lesions of endometriosis that are far apart, you don't wanna do a massive cut. Why? Because the bigger the cut, the bigger the scar. And scar tissue definitely can cause pain. So you only wanna focus on removing the bad, but leaving the good. So this patient went on to ask, um, to explain that she did have her ovaries removed. She's currently on estrogen. So I think you did answer the question um, already that you recommend progesterone. Progesterone, yeah. And dietary modifications, because there's a lot of things in your diet that you can do to work and manage some of these, some of these menopausal symptoms. But it's important to understand if that patient had extensive endometriosis or not at the time of first hysterectomy and oophorectomy. Right. If it was done and she did not have endometriosis in the peritoneum, then it's totally okay for her to take um, estrogen and progesterone, either combination or estrogen alone. Thank you so much for that response. I'm just looking to make sure I'm not leaving any other questions out. <laughs> okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat or the Facebook group. So I'd like to thank you so much from the Trinidad and Tobago Endometriosis Association, Dr. Eugenio, for this wonderful presentation on adenomyosis and your ability to answer all the questions for us today. Um, thank you for taking the time out. It's a pleasure having you here today and being educated. No worries. Thank you for the invitation, guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. We're wrapping up today for Trinidad and Tobago Spotlight Endometriosis. Um, we want to thank everyone for joining. I hope you guys enjoyed the session as much as I did. And we will see you next time. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.